on World News Tonight. Annexation awry. Russia follows through with controversial referendums, the country now claiming that protection is guaranteed for new ground. Racing for impact. Florida fears the worst as tropical storm Ian threatens hurricane-scale destruction. Decisive victory. Georgia Meloni prepares to lead Italy into a hopeful future as the country's first ever female president. And flying fancy. The French Alps sees the best ever costume parades with paragliders dressed up for a carnival. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. And we begin with the updates of the conflict in Ukraine. Russia is fighting back against global backlash on their latest attempt of territorial claim with their controversial referendums in freshly occupied territories. Russia insisted that occupied territories may receive full protection on the condition of annexation. Russia's top diplomat on Sunday defended his nation's military operations in Ukraine and said Russian-occupied parts of that country holding widely criticized referendums could receive Russia's, quote, full protection if annexed by Moscow. This was Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov's response when asked if Russia would have grounds for using nuclear weapons to defend annexed regions of Ukraine. The entire territory of the Russian Federation, which is enshrined, and could be further enshrined in the constitution of the Russian Federation, unquestionably is under the full protection of the state. That is absolutely natural, and all of the laws, doctrines, concepts, and strategies of the Russian Federation apply to all of its territory. Russia calls its actions in Ukraine a special military operation aimed at demilitarizing its neighbor and removing what it calls dangerous nationalists in Kyiv. And residents of Russian-held parts of Ukraine cast ballots on Sunday on whether they wanted to join the Russian Federation, the third day of polling. Ukraine and the West have called the votes a sham effort to illegally acquire territory conquered by Russia since the start of its invasion in February. Kiev and its Western allies fear that Moscow could portray acts to retake the territories and reunify the country as an attack on Russia itself. In Russian-occupied Mariupol, some voters see the referendum as necessary. The annexation efforts come after Russia faced significant strategic setbacks on the battlefield. Russian soldiers beat a hasty and humiliating retreat in the face of a Ukrainian counteroffensive in the northeast part of the country, abandoning hardware and weapons as they fled. Those losses may have prompted President Vladimir Putin to last week order Russia's first military mobilization since World War II. That move triggered protests across Russia and sent many men of military age fleeing. The territory controlled by Russia or Russian-backed forces represents about 15 percent of Ukrainian territory. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky was adamant on Saturday that his country would regain all the territory Russia had taken. Parts of the Caribbean and Canada have been destroyed by Fiona. The storm's power became historic and the damage was so extensive that it could take months, if not years, to clean it all up. Tonight, a daunting recovery along Canada's east coast. A task so massive, the Canadian Armed Forces called in to help. People have seen their homes washed away, seen the winds rip schools, roofs off. But as Canadians, as we always do in times of difficulty, we will be there for each other. The strongest storm ever to slam the nation, post-tropical cyclone Fiona brought wind gusts up to 100 miles an hour and torrential floods, decimating parts of Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, Prince Edward Island and beyond. Entire homes swept to sea. One woman still missing. Power knocked out for half a million. Up and down Canada's coast, countless evacuees desperate to see what's left of the lives they knew. You cannot go to your homes now. Unfortunately, this is going to take days, could take weeks, could take months. Meanwhile, Fiona's overall death count rising, 18 killed so far. Most in Puerto Rico, where more than 800,000 remain without power a week after Fiona hit. Now, as one major storm battered Canada, now a potential hurricane is headed straight for the United States. It is still called the tropical storm Ian, but forecasters expect it to become a hurricane soon. Tonight, scenes of urgency. 
saturating southwest Florida, from cars waiting for sandbags snaking blocks to gas and grocery lines growing by the hour. Bottled water flying off the shelves. You don't see any water. I just got here and it's kind of insane. As Tropical Storm Ian is on the verge of transforming into Hurricane Ian with Florida in the bullseye. It really is important to stress the degree of uncertainty that still exists. And so anybody from Tampa Bay all the way to Escambia County, uh, there are different tracks that would take it into any one of those places. All 67 counties in Florida now under a state of emergency for a storm expected to reach at least a Category 3 status on the Gulf. Governor DeSantis has activated 2,500 National Guardsmen and mobilized utility workers across the state. Tampa's last collision course with a major hurricane was a century ago. Now the cone of uncertainty, to some degree, unleashing chaos. I'm from Chicago. It's my first year down here experiencing the hurricane, so it's like uh, people are really taking this serious, way more serious than I thought. Meanwhile, in Iran, thousands continue to fight back against the government despite deadly crackdowns, demanding justice for the death of a 22-year-old woman at the hands of morality police. Global unrest has not wavered over the death of a 22-year-old Iranian woman detained by the morality police. Demonstrations continue to gain traction all over the world. Protesters clashed with police outside the Iranian embassy in London on Sunday. Outside the White House, protesters denounced what they called Iran's terrorist regime. Terrorist regime of Iran. Iran has summoned both British and Norwegian ambassadors over what it calls interference and hostile media coverage of the nationwide unrest. Foreign Minister Hossein Amir Abdullahian also criticized America's support for rioters, a term Tehran has coined for those who have joined the protest which have swept the country, causing authorities to crack down on security and curb internet freedoms. Demonstrations which erupted just over a week ago after Armini died in detention after being arrested by the morality police, who enforced strict rules in Iran requiring women to cover their hair and wear loose-fitting clothing in public. Rallies have been held continuously over the last week across the globe, from Tehran to Berlin, Toronto and here in Athens. Many protesters have called for the downfall of Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. Women have played a prominent role in the protests. Burning veils and cutting their own hair has become a symbol of defiance. Iran state television said more than 40 people have been killed since the protests broke out. The semi-official Mehr news agency said on Sunday eight members of the Basiji, a militia under the umbrella of the Revolutionary Guards, were among the dead. Details of casualties have trickled out slowly, partly because of the restrictions on communication. Donald Trump is not amused with what he claims is the continuing political attack on him and his family. The former president lashed out against the New York Attorney General, insisting that she deserved to be removed from her post. Former U.S. President Donald Trump snapped at New York's Attorney General Letitia James on Friday at a rally in Wilmington, North Carolina, as he and his family face a civil fraud suit in New York. The attorney general said Trump, who has used his wealth to burnish his image and fame as a successful businessman and politician, fraudulently inflated his net worth by billions of dollars to help his company obtain favorable terms on transactions, including lower interest rates and cheaper insurance coverage. The lawsuit is one of the biggest legal blows for the Republican businessman turned politician since he left office in January 2021. Trump on Friday called for James' removal. But she doesn't just deserve to lose, she deserves to be removed from office, immediately disbarred and banished from the legal profession forever. And that goes for others also. The lawsuit also names Trump's adult children, Donald Trump Jr., Eric Trump, and Ivanka Trump as defendants, as well as longtime company executives. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news.
welcome back to World News Tonight. The United States, along with its allies like South Korea, are working to stabilize and diversify the supply chains of key minerals. The move is seen as a way to counter China's rising dominance over the supply of rare earth elements. During the 77th United Nations General Assembly last week, a key mineral security partnership meeting was held, presided over by U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. There, 11 partner countries, including South Korea, Canada, and Japan, and eight resource-rich countries, including Brazil, Mongolia, and Zambia, agreed on plans to stabilize and diversify the supply chain of core minerals. To each of you, both uh, those from the Mineral Security Partnership countries and those from minerals producing countries, uh, this is, um, I think, one of those sessions where, as we say, it gets real. Um, this makes a difference, a concrete difference, and um, we're very anxious to hear especially from all of you today. The Minerals Security Partnership, which was launched in June, is a U.S.-led initiative for a multilateral cooperative effort to stably secure the supply chain of core minerals necessary for the transition to clean energy. It plans to invest in developing countries with abundant resources by promoting public and private investment in key mineral supply chains such as rare earth elements and lithium while strengthening environmental standards. Critical minerals are at the heart of this transition. Uh, they're essential components of the technologies that will power our clean energy future, like electric vehicles and batteries, uh, wind turbines, solar panels. But the partnership has another major agenda countering China's dominance. That's because China dominates the supply of lithium, cobalt, and rare earth elements, all of which are key materials needed for EV batteries. And it's also the single biggest reason why Western countries are looking to build their own supply chains. The United States plans to continue working with mineral-rich countries over the coming months to determine which projects will benefit most from the Mineral Security Partnership. A right-wing alliance led by Giorgia Meloni's brother of Italy party looks set to win a clear majority in the next parliament, exit poll said after voting ended in an Italian national election. The latest exit polls on Italy's general election have put Giorgia Meloni's party, Brothers of Italy, ahead of all others. As the main party within the right-wing coalition, this could see her become the next Italian prime minister and the first ever woman to do that job in the country. Ahead of the final results, her headquarters were bustling in anticipation. If Matteo Salvini's party, League, which is also part of the right-wing coalition, does as well as projections expect, it will help give the coalition the numbers it needs to form the next government. When casting his vote earlier in the day, he seemed optimistic about the results. Images from the Democratic Party headquarters after the first exit polls came out were in stark contrast to those of its rivals. The atmosphere was stoic. Headed by Enrico Letta, the group is the main political party of the centre-left coalition and the right's main opposition. Exit polls predict it lagging substantially behind the Brothers of Italy, with its coalition partners not able to fill the void. A party standing on its own with no formal coalition was Giuseppe Conti's five-star movement. According to exit polls, the former Prime Minister's party fared well, but without many allies, its future within the Italian Parliament is unclear, and who it may back, unknown. Almost 51 million Italians were eligible to vote in this snap election. But analysts say it may be the worst voter turnout ever seen in Italy, with abstention predicted between 30 to 35 percent. As incumbent Jair Bolsonaro faces off a challenge from left-wing former President Lula da Silva in Brazil's elections, a group of determined Bolsonaro supporters is mobilizing for action, convinced that a communist threat hangs over their country and fiercely defending the sitting president. It was a festive rally on Sunday. Presidential candidate Luis Inácio Lula da Silva spoke to a crowd of supporters at a samba school in Rio de Janeiro. He took aim at his main rival, incumbent President Jair Bolsonaro, and also addressed his decision not to take part in a presidential debate earlier in the weekend. I like debate, but it's getting difficult. 
because few people are in a position to be running in the election. And the five other candidates who attended the debate had only one goal, to attack me, because I'm in first place. A recent poll put Lula in the lead with 47% of the vote, followed by Bolsonaro with an estimated 33%. Results which were brushed aside by Bolsonaro on Saturday. I don't trust the polls. In 2018, Datafoya got nothing, absolutely nothing right. I don't know where his voters are, because I went to Gary News last week and I was welcomed as a pop star with deep respect from the people. Center-left candidate Ciro Gomez said Lula's absence showed he was overconfident. If elected, it would be Lula's third term as president. Hailing from a working-class background, he trained as a metal worker and became involved in trade union activism, leading him to found the Workers' Party, along with others, in 1980. His legacy is mixed. He is credited for major reforms, such as increasing minimum wage, but his image was also tainted by a stint in prison on bribery convictions. If neither candidate wins a majority of votes, they will face off in a second round on October 30th. Movie plots through the decades are now predicting the future of life on Earth as mission DART by NASA is preparing for a collision course with an oncoming asteroid project to pose a threat to our planet. On the way for humanity's first ever planetary defense test mission. It's a first of its kind save the planet experiment. Max Q. NASA about to slam a spacecraft into a small harmless asteroid millions of miles away. The mission to determine if NASA can deflect an asteroid should one end up on a collision course with Earth. It's like a real life version of the film Armageddon. Not a soul on Earth can hide from it. The mission began last November when the spacecraft named DART launched into space atop a Falcon 9 rocket. Its target, an asteroid named Dimorphos, some 7 million miles from Earth. If all goes to plan, DART will slam into it head on at 7.14 p.m. Eastern Time Monday night at 14,000 miles per hour. The impact should be just enough to nudge the asteroid into a slightly tighter orbit around a nearby larger asteroid, throwing it off its course. Conventional wisdom in, in planetary defense is that you just want to move it as one piece rather than blow it to pieces. And it's not just NASA worrying about asteroids. The Pentagon's Space Command is too. NASA insists no asteroids are currently threatening Earth. But unlike the movie Don't Look Up... There's a comet headed directly towards Earth. NASA wants to be prepared if one comes our way. Welcome back to World News Tonight, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Preparations were underway in central Tokyo for former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's state funeral, in which 6,000 guests and 190 foreign delegations are expected to attend. South Korea and the U.S. will begin a combined naval exercise. This comes a day after North Korea launched a short-range ballistic missile in an apparent protest against the deployment of an American aircraft carrier to the region for the joint drill. Tennis legend Roger Federer lost the final game of his career at the Lava Cup. For his goodbye game, the Swiss great partnered with his longtime Spanish rival Rafael Nadal in a doubles game against Francis Tiafo and Jack Sock at O2 Arena in London. Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. conducted an aerial survey of damage brought by Typhoon Noru, which left heavy flooding across several northern provinces as authorities rushed to get aid to thousands of evacuees. Some hundreds of Germans protested, calling to put into service the halted Nord Stream 2 pipeline project that was designed to transport fuel from Russia. Russia to Germany, but was put on ice after the war in Ukraine broke out. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Now from Top Gun pilots to billiard players and a handful of brides, paragliders in fancy dresses took to the skies over the French Alps. We leave you tonight with the visuals of around 100 paragliders participating in the annual flying festival, Carnival. Thank you for joining us. Stay safe and have a good night.